much attention by designers, engineers, and business people is devoted to styling a car. Every angle, each surface, and all materials are scrutinized to create a sculpted-like art piece that eventually leads to concept and then a production model. As the buy-in public, we spend a considerable amount of time appreciating the beauty of cars, anxiously awaiting each new model year. The motoring press and the manufacturers tease us with the photographs of these fine machines. Usually the photographs show the vehicle's exterior in some setting that appeals to our aspirations. Often technologies, whether it be powertrain, safety, or new convenience features, dominate space in articles and advertisements. Occasionally the photographs may show the utility, comfort, or luxury of the seats. Less common are photographs of the dashboard panels, gauges, and controls. I find this curious. I believe that as drivers, we spend more time looking at the dash than any other part of the car. We spend countless hours driving to work, school, shopping, and recreation. We're always, or should be, checking our speed, the status of the car's condition via the gauges and warning lights, and adjusting controls such as climate and entertainment. This is where time should be invested. The design of the dashboard should not merely satisfy the driver, but endeavor to ensure driver pleasure in functionality, layout, tactical feel, and visual attractiveness. As I was researching the coverage of instrument panels and manufacturers' press materials and brochures, a curious pattern emerged. Unless the dash, gauges, or controls introduced a new technology, dashes were rarely covered or photographed. Even rarer was the presence of an illuminated dash, that became the subject of this book. I limited the time period of my research of the 60s through the 90s. Up to the mid-60s, most manufacturers' advertisements and brochures were drawings, not photographs. Thus, few examples of factory photographed illuminated dashes can be found in that decade. By the 80s, digital LED instruments and trip computers were emerging and subsequently their images began appearing in sales materials and media kits. The reason? Manufacturers talk and exhibit dashes only when there's new technology involved. This was true in the 60s when Chrysler introduced electroluminescence. It's abundantly present in the 80s with the digitalization of dashes using LEDs, LCDs, and CRTs. In between, during the 70s, there was little change. During the 60s and 70s, most gauges were edge-lit or flood-lit, and by the mid-80s to the 90s, gauges were becoming backlit. Those are a lot of terms I threw out in just a few sentences here, so let's define them with meanings appropriate for automotive usage. Edge lit. Here the light bulbs are placed behind the faceplate of the gauges. The light bends between the bezels and the opaque faceplates, which do not have transparent numbers or letters. The effect creates a glow of light over the gauges. There are many examples of this in the book of this type of lighting. Here are photographs from my collection, including a 1980 Lincoln Versailles, a 1982 Mercury Fugger XR7, and a 1985 Chrysler LeBaron. Perhaps more so than any other manufacturer photograph that I encountered, this one stages and catches the ambiance enjoyed by the glow of edge-lit dash lights, flooding their instruments and gauges and filling the space with almost fireplace-like warmth and serenity. Floodlit. The light bulbs placed in front of the gauges and controls deliver a broad beam of light over a large area. This 1967 Plymouth Fury 3 is an example of floodlit illumination. Backlit. The light bulbs are placed behind the faceplate of the gauges and controls. The light appears to illuminate only the numbers and letters because they are translucent, while the faceplate is opaque. Many examples of this are shown in the book. Here we see the dash of a 1994 Thunderbird SC. Electroluminescence. This form of lighting uses a direct conversion of electricity to charge a phosphorescent material which emits light without generating heat. The 1960 Chryslers and Imperials and the 1966 Dodge Charger are examples of this technology shown in the book. According to Chrysler's press material, the benefits of electroluminescence includes that it's a flat lamp source that can be cut into any desired shape. It is rugged and stable and can withstand great abuse and shock. 
It has an unusually long life, up to ten times as great as conventional lamps, and it never burns out suddenly, but rather gradually declines in intensity over time. LED, or light-emitting diodes, are semiconductors that emit light when an electrical current passes through it. They are often used in digital instruments, such as those in the 1984 Chrysler shown here. LCD, or liquid crystal displays, are a flat panel screen using liquid crystals between two polarizing materials in which the electric current causes the crystals to align, allowing or blocking the light. Examples of LCDs in this book include a 1985 Chevrolet Corvette and a 1985 Mercury Cougar LS, as shown here. CRT, or cathode ray tube, otherwise familiar to us as the television screen or monitor prior to the introduction of the flat screen monitor. It uses electron beams to strike a phosphorescent surface, in this case the inside of a glass vacuum tube. The 1989 Buick Riata and Riviera use touch CRTs to display and activate climate and stereo controls. My books are not about critical opinions, but rather sharing what I've learned with my observations while providing information from the manufacturers showing how they position their products. Because style is subjective, I don't project my preferences on you, the reader, but rather let you draw your own conclusions. My objective is to provide a sampling that shows the evolution of dash and instrument design. Along the way, though, I encountered questions. There are two that I want you to consider. First, do analog gauges make cars sportier? At first, digital readouts and gauges and controls implied a greater technical prowess and achievement. As digitalization proliferated, a backlash from purists decried the use of digital instruments in sport cars. Yet manufacturers believed that a quick glance at digital gauges were faster to read, allowing the driver to rapidly return their eyes to the road. Some cars combined both analog and digital instruments for the same function, speedometer, tachometer, fuel, etc., giving the driver the best of both worlds. What are your preferences? My second question I want you to consider is do lighting colors make a difference? There's a variety of light colors across all manufacturers and sometimes within a manufacturer's lineup in a single model year. Red and orange imply sportiness, blue and green seem to calm and white optimizes clarity. In my experience, the red-orange illumination made me uneasy as I associate those colors with warnings. I felt the whole dash was telling me there's something wrong with the car. Then as I acclimated to the color, I was worried that I would miss a warning light. I found white, backlit, illuminated gauges were very clear, if not boring. I favor the green and blue light colors. Think about your experiences. Do you have a dash light color preference, and would it impact a car buying decision? If you're like me, perhaps you can't wait for nightfall and an airing just so that you can turn on the lights and drive in all of these interior brilliances. For more information about this book on dash lights or my other books about American cars of the 80s and popular American automotive design trends such as personal luxury cars and couture cars and opera windows, visit www.those80scars.com.